Welcome to the Woven Energy Podcast on Real Practical Shamanism with me, Joseph Sykora and Damon Smith. We are here once again, and as always, to talk about shamanism from the ground up. So this week, we are taking a short break from our journey into stage four of shamanic technique, and we are embarking on a little side episode. Now, Damon and me have a, a bit of a document going, and we talk about various ideas for episodes that we can do. And Damon just said out of the blue, I know. Let's talk about the shaman staff. That'll be good. <laughs> so I thought, brilliant. That'll give me a nice title to work with for once. It's, it's quite difficult to come up with episode titles for for stage four. They're all they're all a little bit too. Uh, oh, uh, tell am, me about ambiguous, it. <laughs> ambiguous. So this this is a good one for me. Um, so you know, I've done a quick Google search on shaman staff, and as always, you know, you, if you type anything shamanism related <laughs> into Google, you get a lot of nonsense back but uh, you know i yeah i'm getting a getting a pretty good idea of what we're going to talk about um and i imagine there's uh there's quite a lot of uh, similarity between the staff and perhaps the robe and the reasons behind the robe but anyway yeah. we'll get all into that uh the first thing damon is to say how you doing man are you all right i'm good mate how are you doing I am fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have some patrons or a patron to to thank. I, we I have think, a new we? patron, Colleen, uh, Colleen Flory. Thank you ever so much for joining up and supporting us. That's wonderful. I believe Colleen's in Canada. So uh, our international tribe of patrons uh, grows and grows. We should we should have some sort of name for the patron tribe, shouldn't we? Maybe just call them the tribe. Uh, but they are the the people who support us and and keep us going and uh, have contributed a huge amount to the podcast um, over the years. I mean, not least actually keeping it going, which is a big thing because it probably wouldn't have been if it hadn't been for them. But also mm. all sorts of logistical support. There's some good discussions going between the patrons. We have like a um, discussion group for the power patrons and uh, our founder patrons. And so... Yeah, it, it's been amazing. And a lot of the things, right, like the, the seminars that we did recently in Austria, they would never have happened without the patrons. It's set up by patrons and basically run by patrons. So, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, I, yeah, and um, another thing I think we're planning out with Damon at some point, we don't know when, but we're going to do a Q&A session. So anybody who's a, a patron will get the chance to ask any absolutely. questions and, and we can we can put together a... A, 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 a question and answer session, or probably uh, probably two. Or yeah, three. we did we did a few um, of those early on, didn't we, on the podcast? We did, and and I thought they were really good because yeah, you know they 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 fill in a few gaps and and perhaps give us a new perspective to approach certain topics from that we've already talked about. And you know, we do talk about things, we talk about similar things over and over again on this podcast. And I think that is actually, for once, a really good thing because every time we talk about something, it's always from a different perspective, a different way in, a, a different angle. So, you know, yeah. I'm really And also the, way, the, the, way the that fact goes. that we, we don't necessarily prepare these podcasts, they're not exactly scripted or anything. I do recall <laughs> once once you just threw it at me out of the blue, it was one of these Q&A sessions, you said, what do werewolves have to do with shamanism? And I'm like, oh my God. Well, so where do I start? You know, where do <laughs> you I start, start talking about? You, know? you started talking about a movie or something, didn't you? <laughs> <That's> it, yeah. <laughs> you thought I was talking about a movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I do like London that movie, American Werewolf in London. It's one of my favourite movies, but it's got nothing to do with shamanism. <laughs> so, so yeah. Well, anyway, I mean, I've, I've looked at our stats. Yeah, I've looked at our our location stats as well in the in the podcast app we use, and uh, we are truly global. We have um, lots of people from all over the world now. So, indeed. Really, really good. That's fantastic. Uh, so, so, Absolutely fantastic. You know, Canada, US, all across Europe. So, mm. oh, we have a couple in Mongolia as well, uh, which is fantastic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> claim I don't know why they need to listen to us, but there we go. Well, <laughs> there you go. Uh, claim to fame, I'm guessing, you know. So, so yeah. Uh, thanks to our patrons. All of you are awesome. Yeah, and you can also uh, obviously go to patreon.com slash woven energy. Uh, you can see all the various options to support us and sign up and uh, all the uh, various perks that you get. Um, so the shaman staff, Damon, uh, mm. what is it? Okay, so first, first of all, <laughs> it's not a thing. It's not there, There's not a thing called a shaman staff. Uh, it's just a stick, right? So mm -hmm. sawa in, in Mongol. And it's just like you said, it, the shaman's costume, the shaman's robes, whatever you want to call it, 
it has a purpose, and just about everything in shamanism has a purpose. Shamans sometimes use mirrors. The mirror has a purpose. Shamans are well known to use drums. Got one stuck up on the wall above my head. The drum has a purpose, has a wide range of purposes, actually. And a stick or staff is no different. So yeah, We haven't spent enough time on this podcast on the drum. We've talked about it, but I'd love to explore that drum in more depth. Uh, we we definitely did. I think we did a, a, a quite a, a decent amount on booking Henger. We did on stage two. We used we yeah, used it for yeah. stage two and briefly stage three. But uh, yeah, that's right. That's I think right. there's definitely a lot more to explore. Anyway, sorry. So carry on. no, that's fine, mate. So in terms of spirit dance, the the staff, like all of the other stuff that shamans use, including the catalyst that people like to talk about, you know, things like mescaline and psilocybin and those sort of things, DMT. It, these things all have purposes in shamanism. They're not like, it, 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 they're not badges of rank. They're not something that you have to have or be in order to be a shaman. You don't have to have a shaman's drum to be a shaman. You don't have to have a shaman's staff to be a shaman. They are tools or implements. Human beings are tool using creatures. And so in our shamanism, these things are quite prominent because that's been a big part of who we are. As a, as a, if you want to use the word species, as a, as a group of natural animals, our tool use has been a big part of who we are. We are not the only animals on the planet who could do that. Orangutans famously go spear fishing and stuff like that, but we are quite good at it. And a lot of that comes from our ability to oppose our thumb to the other fingers. If you just touch the tip of your thumb to the tips of your other fingers, it seems like quite an easy thing for a human to do. The vast majority of animals cannot do that, so. That allows us, although we are quite delicate for an animal of our size, we're not very robust, you know, compared to a tiger or whatever, or rhinoceros or anything, but we uh, we can do this amazing thing that allows us to use tools, which are very close to our nature as human beings. And as you know, shamanism a lot is about the shaman is always seeking to dissolve within nature. But it's okay to dissolve within our nature. We we study other animals. We use animal spirits. And I use it all the time, animal spirits in, in spirit dance. We use that kind of thing. We study other animals in order to look back at ourselves in a different kind of way, In with a, as, as Terence McKenna would describe it, with a non-ordinary state of consciousness. We look at ourselves in a way that we don't normally look at ourselves through the lens of shamanism. One of the ways we can do that is to take what we're good at, tool use, and incorporate that into our shamanism and use tools to teach us about nature. A stick. So rather than calling it something dramatic like the shaman staff, why don't we just call it a stick <laughs> as, a, as a translation <laughs> of so on. That's a, a much better, you know, kind of... Yeah, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's it's not wizards and... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's absolutely not wizards. So what can a stick teach us? So uh, we, we're going to have to wind back to level three here, not level two. So I'm going to give a bunch of examples of the use of a stick and how that can enhance your radar for nature through spirit dance. The human body is able to move in a, a quite a wide-ranging um, number of ways it doesn't necessarily mean from a spirit point of view that moving in all of those ways is very sensible. I mean, it's at times probably moving in all those ways has a purpose within spirit dance. But we try to keep chalisty on in spirit dance, and some of those ways are so awkward and unusual that they don't exactly support the necessity of chalisty permeating the spirit dance. One of the things you can use a stick for in your spirit dance is to introduce a marker of nature, what I would call a marker of nature. There is something physical within your dance that will either allow or disallow certain types of movement, certain ranges of movement. And the purpose of a stick, or one of the primary purposes of a stick within your spirit dance is to take that continuity that we're looking for in spirit dance. You know, we're always trying to, we're talking about in our level four stuff, we're talking about keeping the thread of energy that runs through it alive, not allowing it to die, not allowing it to be mm. cut. The same thing can be done in a physical sense with a, with a staff, where you're dancing with a staff or stick. 
you, the stick becomes a part of you. It's like that cloud of bees that we talked about. You know, that, that notional cloud of bees that may be, you know, again, I'm in some ways regretting having used that analogy, but the the thread of energy that runs through your spirit dance, through your body and through the environment, can also run through that stick. Yeah. But the thing with the stick is, the way the way that most people do not have uh, experience of moving through a stick, they don't have that experience in their lives in the same way that they do have of moving just their body. You know, we talked about you go and flick a light switch. Your body is used to doing that kind of thing. But a lot of the movements you can make with a stick, unless you're versed in, you know, martial arts or whatever that use sticks, a lot of people are not used to that. And so the stick, A, forming an overall part of your physical chelicity, of the structure of your that supports your physical chelicity at all times without any break in that, and B, forming an overall part of your momentum, not the stick's momentum, your momentum or your energy pattern that you're creating in your dance and maintaining that at all times throughout your dance. So there's a thread from the beginning to the end. Most people have a real problem doing this. Um, and it's it's the stick makes it apparent the inability, the initial inability to do it the stick makes that very apparent. Whereas if you just sort of move around and wave your arms around without a stick, it's often covered up by the fact that you are familiar with some sort of range of movement in your life. The stick introduces the reality of nature into your physical structure because especially if that stick's not very bendy, it's it's a harsh reality. If it's heavy, it could even hurt you if it comes around and hits you in whatever way. So the ideal thing in practicing spirit dance with a stick is that just like you, the stick never stops moving. It never stops changing. It never stops turning. But the ways in which it's moving and turning are fully part of your physical chelicity. They are simply an extension of your physical chelicity. And so this works out really nicely in terms of, you remember a while back, how do you know whether your shamanism is real or imagined? Yeah. Well, you try mm. spirit dancing with a heavy stick, um, you'll find out very quickly whether your spirit dance is real or imagined, whether your ability to do that is real or imagined, because the stick's going to be falling on the ground, it's going to be hitting you in the face, it's going to be, you're going to be tripping Oh, you're going to be hitting other things, I presume. Oh, you're going to be hitting like other whatever's things. Whatever's in your the, grove. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, so within and you're the context of the. you're going to be stopping the... and starting, and the stick will make it very, very obvious that there's not a. that the, the thread of the dance is not standing throughout. The stick will make it more. I mean, it is fairly obvious when you're doing it without a stick, but the stick will and does help to make it very obvious because mm. if it's a big heavy stick, if it's a long stick, you know, if you're talking about something that's between six and eight feet long or six, and nine feet long, you're going to know when that stick stops moving. And you're going to know that when that stick stops moving in relation to you stopping moving, even if it's for a fraction of a second, the stick makes it much more obvious than it is. Do you follow what I mean? It makes it much yeah. more obvious than it is when you're just doing it by yourself. And the great thing, it, it, sorry, mate, it sorry. becomes an extension of you, doesn't it? Uh, within the context, within the, within the momentum of the dance, it's like the stick becomes an extension of you. It is you. That's, that's the point. And as I said, shamanism, what shams are trying to do is dissolve within nature. The mm. great thing is with the, with wood in general, trees and sticks and stuff are just amazing things for shamanistic practice. Even when the tree's stuck in the ground, it's still a stick, right, of, of a sort, you know. They are amazing yeah. things for shamanistic practice, and we've talked about use of trees in lots of different ways uh, to enhance your shamanistic practice at all of the levels. The advantage of having a stick is that it also has, especially if it's a very natural stick, I mean, you know, you've for, for the stuff in Austria, Tamo cut a bunch of very natural sticks from the from the wood that he had available. He lives in near some forests. 
uh, from the wood that we had available. So we were using very natural sticks. Um, and they have a surface texture. They're very nice to handle. The, the sensation on your body and on your arms, and on your hands, of using the stick or the staff as you move around also adds to the complexity and the flavor of the dance. Just like, I think, as I've said a lot of times, I'd spend a lot of time hugging trees, you know. My reputation is is a bit of a, you know, a tree hugger. Um, but what I'm well, actually now doing... doing and I, from what I hear, it wasn't in the past. Oh, well, <laughs> no. But, I mean, the thing is, people people misunderstand what a tree hugger is. I, think, so. So I, don't, <laughs> think they, I don't think those two things are inconsistent with each other. But the, the, what I'm actually doing is I love tree bark. I love the feel of it. So as I'm moving around a tree, I'm often gently running my hand over the surface of the bark to get the character of the tree, to get the flavor of it. Because... What you find is trees are very, very different from each other. And that's when you greet a tree, especially if it's a tree you're not familiar with, it's very important to greet it gently. You know, using the terrell position, I think I've talked about this moving very recently, moving towards a tree and allowing the tree to turn you. If you're in the terrell position moving towards it, the the, the tree, the, the, the bowl of the tree, the trunk of the tree, will naturally swing you around it as you move forwards. But it's very, very important to do that in a gentle way because some trees are lovely and you can swing on them hard and you can really get that physically strong interaction. You can feel the joy of their springiness. That's what's great about trees. They are not just rocks, well, some of them are, but just rock solid. There's a springiness in the wood which adds a beautiful character into the weave of your dance. But you must greet them lightly because you may regret it. You get the wrong kind of tree, it will punish you for a harsh interaction. Um, so, so yeah, so greet can a tree you, can lightly. You, can you expand on that? Can you expand on that? Uh, yeah, you basically will rip your, <laughs> rip your hand to pieces if you go in with some species of tree are yeah. well able to do that. Yeah. Uh, they, and then not, they're all different. They're all different. But out of Yeah, courtesy, so we're not talking about anything mystical here. We're, we're not no, talking about anything. Talking about gashes all over your arms and stuff like that, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, which I've had many times. And sometimes there's something to be learned through that, a bit of roughness in the play, um, in the torsion teen within nature. You know, sometimes I do come out. It's true. I do come out with cuts on my arms and stuff like that, you know. But you'd be surprised how few of those kind of injuries I actually get, given the kind of thing that I do with trees. And obviously you've got all stuff like tree climbing and all that kind of stuff, which is another big thing on shamanism. I've uh, done a ton of that in my life. I don't do as much as I used to, but I had some, probably the worst injuries I've had through shamanistic practice have been through tree climbing rather than um, dancing with trees and poles and stuff like that. So the um, the... the the thing with the wood is it's a very natural, beautiful part of nature that speaks to you and becomes part of you. And you want to dissolve in your spirit dance, you want to dissolve with the stick. Now, in terms so of. Is that. Go on. Sorry. I was just going to say, in terms of the practicalities of how you do that, I can give some basics. Um, I can give some examples of basics of how you might go about doing that. Um, but if you had a question, mate, go for it. Well, I was going to say, is there something uh, there about developing an affinity with a particular staff with a shaman? So a shaman might say, um, have a have a staff that he particularly or he or she particularly uh, enjoys, particularly has an affinity with, and they keep that throughout their entire life. Or sure, is that something? I, because I of that particular practicing... character of that staff? Or, yeah, yeah. You know. the, there are definitely ones that I prefer practicing with. Um, I've got one somewhere that I had since, I've had since the 1980s. But I, I think it would be, it's a bit limiting just to practice with one staff or stick. That, that, that'd be very limiting. Uh, I, would, yeah. I would rather get a variety of different things, some smooth, some naturalistic, some more shaped, you know, because what you really want to develop is a sense for the structure of nature. And a staff has that very great strength, but it also has that springiness within it. Those two things are very close to what we've talked about in terms of those two kind of fundamental uh, changes within nature, tolka and negdech, that are important when you're learning spirit dance, both at level three and at level four. Um, the, the, 
Tusk or the Jag being that kind of supporting quality and the neg deck being that kind of joining quality, a, a staff has those things intrinsically. And so here's a way to think about it. Rather than making you making the staff part of you, which is the way that they talk about sort of weapons use in some martial arts. So for instance, in Xing Yi, the weapons use is talked about, you make the weapon part of yourself. Actually, why not think about it the other way around in a shamanistic way, way which is the the staff makes you part of it. Do you follow what I mean? The the staff has the lead. The staff represent is the representative of nature in that interaction. And as a shaman, you want nature to be your teacher. The staff or stick is the teacher in that interaction. You are not teaching the staff. The staff is teaching you. That's the idea. And so the great thing if you use quite a heavy staff is that it has an intrinsic almost will. It has an intrinsic, well, they all do, light ones do as well, but it's easier to pick up on when it's heavy. It has an intrinsic will in itself because it's heading a certain way and depending on how you're turning or moving around with the staff, it it's going somewhere. And in a way, it's deciding where it's going. You're just playing the supporting role. If you want to think about in terms of partner dance, you know, think of something like um, in, you know, a, a a Latin dance like salsa, one person leads and the other person kind of follows. Well, the person leading is the staff. The person following is you, the shaman. That's the that's a way to think about that as partner dance. And it is wonderful. And you, you have to learn because we also have this at, at level three, we all have this constant desire to increase the complexity of the um of the the weave of the movement that we're using in order to use it as a better, more able, or to generate a better, more able radar for nature, that doesn't stop when you put a stick in your hand or two sticks in your hand or however many sticks you want to use, it doesn't stop there. That requirement is maintained. So you have to learn because moving with a stick is much more unfamiliar to most people. How do you move around with a huge variety of movements with a stick? Well, you're going to have to learn that stuff. And who's going to teach you? The stick is going to teach you. But I can give you some things to get you started. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, just a sec, because I've got one. So would a would a would a shaman? Um, and I don't mean to keep people hanging. I've just got these questions. But would a shaman attach things to the staff? Then, so for instance, absolutely. Uh, you know, for instance, like uh, like tassels or like 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 bells or like uh, something that would that would give it a sound or a vibration or something. Absolutely. Because because I'm I'm immediately struck with this thought of. And, and uh, I'm just going to throw this at you, Damon, to get your reaction um, because it's probably quite primitive. But you know, just just ha- holding a staff and literally just um, just just uh, hammering it on the floor over and over again in a in a repetitive way to feel the vibration oh, back coming on the back Tyrac, and Tyrac, hear the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're back on the I didn't, I didn't say that Tyrak <laughs> didn't have any value. It does. It does have value and you can learn things from that. And that's just it. But that's like using a staff like it's a drum, right? It's like that's a drum. Thing. Yes, well, exactly. Just, and just, that was just my Just to thought. say that's perfectly legitimate. There's nothing wrong with it, except that a drum is way better for that than a staff is. That's all. Um, yeah. You will learn far more from a drum than you will from a staff if that's the way in which you're using it. That's my only because you get more feedback and more resonance, uh, and it's ri- the character is richer. Yeah, there's yeah. there's there's a richer character, but absolutely you can do that, and you can put that into your spirit dance as well as an as a um, a way of making your spirit dance richer. And so can one I, of the can ways. I say something? Yeah, go for it. Uh, sorry, I, I, can I go on off on a, a very slight tangent? And I'll tell you about one thing about resonance and and, and like with the um, the drum has a really complex resonance. And I remember I uh, took some substances and um, was in a particular headspace at the time, and I was listening to I I, I very much enjoy listening to say classical music on you know in that kind of a state, and I was listening to some piano music and. To a certain extent, it actually began to really grate on me because the resonance of the strings, the re- the, mm. the the piano strings that were so low, was so intense and so overwhelming um, yeah. that I had to stop listening to it. Um, yes, I don't know. I, and that was a random what thought that came do. into my that's head. That's what catalysts do. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. they uh, overemphasize things, 
And so you, you've got to think about what you're actually trying to do with that resonance in shamanism. It's not there to entertain anybody. It's not there to make beautiful music, although we have done an episode on Helung, the, the wonderful um, shamanistic band. Um, the, we've done a, a review of some of their music on Heretics. Um, so check that out. Uh, and, and not take anything from those guys. They're, they're fantastic, fantastic, and definitely uh, one of the most shamanistic bands I've ever come across, to be honest. The issue really is that in in real shamanistic technique, you're not trying to entertain anybody. The resonance is there. It's not there because it's pleasing. It's what is the resonance doing within the context of nature and within you, if you want to think of it a level two kind of thing. What is that level resonance doing in terms of your own internal resonance? What's going on inside you? It was rattling my brain is what it was doing. Yes, and that's why it would have probably been a much better technique not to use the catalyst and just experience the same thing without it. <laughs> you probably yeah, learned often, a lot I, I have actually, I've actually thought about that. But what I thought was interesting is that because it was a solo piano and you got those rich low-end notes with that huge resonance, mm. I never got any of that listening to orchestral music which I yeah. thought was quite interesting. And that's a lot richer. It's a lot more complex, whereas a, a, a solo piano is relatively simplistic in terms yeah. of its resonance and its vibrations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so let me give you an, another analogy. I mean, Joe, thanks to Joe, by the way, for the help he's been giving me recently with my audio setup. Uh, we've been working hard on it. This is like round three. And hopefully <laughs> it, it sounds okay these days. Well, well, we'll see what this one comes out like. But um, if I give you an analogy on that, I don't know how much people know about audio recording. I knew nothing when we started these podcasts, literally nothing about it. But there's a concept called headroom. And headroom is where you, on a recording track, you cr change the what's called the gain on the track. And if you turn it up, the, the loudness of the track goes up towards a sort of maximum point, um, which is like, which is where the, the track starts. It was known as clipping. Yeah, and you actually lose information if you go over yeah. that point. So you like to leave a lot of headroom in your audio track so that you can later do processing on it or just so that it sounds better and it doesn't sound like it's clipping all the time. The yeah. problem with catalysts used too early in shamanism is that is exactly that. That's an analogy for it. Yeah. It creates too much nature clipping. Um, that's a, a kind of analogy for what the problem is. There's no headroom in it for um, people aren't ready for on, on train, don't have enough bat to support that kind of activity. And so what I'd rather encourage people to do is increase their sensitivity to nature to the point where they can pick up on these things without the amplification that those catalysts provide, some of them provide, they all do slightly mm. different things, but some of them provide amplification. You can pick up with, without the amplification, so then you can do it, and then you have a choice whether you want to use the catalyst in your technique for what the catalyst is actually intended for, which is not that. The, the catalyst is intended to support Modoc, which is like level five stuff. Um, it's not intended just to amplify. The, the, the amplification is a problem. It's not, a, it's not part of the solution. It's part of the problem. So the... The thing coming back to the staff, the thing coming back to that is that's also an amplifier. It's an amplifier for your movement, for your physical movement in the dance. So one of the things that you need to do, talking about is there a staff that you prefer, I'd rather say you need to become familiar with whatever staff you're using. I would highly recommend using more than one staff and having them quite different from each other. I personally use ones that are quite as as I've gone through time, I started off with just like nicely finished off poles that were quite smooth and didn't have any branches on them or anything. And then as as I've gone through time, I've in in enjoyed. I've come to a point where I want my staff to be pretty naturalistic. I'm quite happy for it to have a branches sticking out of it or things hanging off it or you know maybe attach something to it, tassels or whatever you want to attach to it. Um, all of that stuff adds to its character. I don't just want to yeah, practice or even with just making one what type making the staff. tip of it really heavy. Sorry, making the tip of it really yeah. heavy would completely yeah, yeah. change Absolutely. the dynamic of it, wouldn't it? Uh, but I don't just want to practice with one type of staff. That's that's yeah. 
my yeah. point. I'd li- rather, I think it's more beneficial to have a variety. And they're definitely not the same. Some things that are easy with a heavy staff, or they flow very nicely with a heavy staff, just don't with a light one and vice versa. So, and in terms of where the weighting is and this type of stuff. So, to get into something practical that people can do to try this out, first of all, if if you're just starting out, I would recommend a stick, just just to make your life easy. I would recommend a stick that is about the same length as you are tall. So if you're six feet tall or six foot staff, something like that. But don't it doesn't don't be pedantic oh, wow. about it. It doesn't have yeah. to be exactly. But don't have don't start with a stick that's too much shorter than your height. That that's I mean that you can practice with sticks that are shorter than your height, but that's actually more difficult. Uh, you want quite a big stick. The but you don't want one that's too much taller than you because then you get a lot of practical issues coming in that will distract you from utility at least early on. So something is about your height is is good. And one of the f- the first thing is to get to know it. And one of the ways that I have found that is quite good to get to know it is the half task position, the folded wings position that we've talked about a lot in our level three stuff. I lay the stick over both of my elbow joints over the top of both my elbow joints and i cradle it a bit like i'm cradling a baby so you got roughly yep. equal amounts of stick sticking out both sides and then i would just start walking around the grove practicing my chillicity carrying the stick with me but when i turn when i make a turning motion i will move with the stick as if it's part of me that's what i mean when i turn my body the stick is turning with me it's it's turning as a natural part of my movement. Or oh, maybe it's more like the stick is turning and I'm following it. That's the that's the general idea of it. And then the next thing is when you go out to Terilt, the the most open position that I tend to use, the the stick goes out over one arm or the other. And so one of the one end of the stick will then be behind your back. So what I mean is when you open from the has task, when you're in the half task position which is like the position you would hit the drum in if you're holding a drum, the stick is cradled in both arms. But if I, generally one of the nicest and most um, pleasing things or the most uh, enlightening things you can do when getting to know a stick is that if I'm turning to the right, so say I'm circling around my grove in a clockwise direction, I'm turning to the right. As I turn to the right, I open out the staff so that it's lying over, still lying over the elbow of my right arm. The end of the stick that was sticking out to the right is now behind my back. And the end of the stick that was sticking out to the left over my left arm is now out to the right. And so I'm turning into the stick or well, the stick yep. is turning me around to the right. Then I change direction. I turn to the left. The stick comes into half tass again. So it's now over, over both elbows. And then I extend out into Tyrolt again, and I'm turning out to the left, and the stick is out to my left with the end of the stick that was out to my left is now behind my back again. So the stick is turning me into the turns. That's the point. I'm following the stick, which is the the state of being that you want to be in when you're doing spirit dance with a staff. You are following the stick. The stick is not following you. So the stick is leading you into all of your turns. That's a really nice, very basic exercise to to do um yeah and i can imagine it's very easy effort. easy quote unquote to to get that feeling of the momentum just on that turn and and and, and le- like you say like the stick can lead you um, yeah the stick is leading can, you that's the mode you want to be in for all of your spirit dance with staff but it's a very very yeah. simple exercise but also in a way it's a quite an how can i describe it it's quite an intimate exercise you're getting to know the stick very intimately. You're cradling it like it's a baby. And when it leads you, it's coming out from your embrace every time. And so, mm. and then it's returning to your embrace. And so that allows you, as you open out into Tyrrellt, uh, for those that don't know what Tyrrellt is, listen to back episodes, many of them. And also uh, look at the, um, look at the, the Woven NG podcast, um, picture with the girl on it that that's terrible position so if you just imagine her standing there instead of just her arms out her arms are out in the same position but the staff is lying over one elbow or the other um sort of 
just having come out of the Havtas embrace. Mm. The, the, the point is it's a very intimate way to get to know your staff and, and how it will affect your movement. Remember, if you're in a state of chillicity, you will be picking up on, and, and, and your amskar is good, you'll be picking up a lot of differences between different staffs, third staves, that you're using sticks. Let's, let's go with the sticks, plural. You'll be picking up on lots of different, subtle differences between different sticks that you use just for this one very, very basic shamanistic technique, um, which is f- sort of almost like the foundational technique of my spirit dance when I'm using a staff. Now, there's a million, bi- millions of ways you can use a, a stick in spirit dance. Uh, and I do. I have very complex, um, which I think some of the attendees of the attendees of the the spirit dance seminars we did in Austria will um, attest there's an awful lot of ways you can use a staff even in you know a short period of time like that we got quite a lot of things uh, done but so one of the ways to to not to think about it but to feel is that you when you especially if it's a stick that's new to you the purpose is not to use the stick as a tool to do spirit dance the purpose of what you're doing is to get to know that stick. That's that's really what you're doing in in the basics, and especially with the new staff, that's one of the ways in which I'll you get develop to, that to know deep it. familiarity with it. Yeah, and it's it's not even your partner in a way; it's you, but it's not the stick becoming you; it's you becoming the stick. That's the so, so it would be one of those exercises that would be good to um, try and regain your chillicity because whenever you try something new, mm. you drop out of chillicity as you build up your familiarity, and then it's easier to get back into chillicity, right? So, exactly. it sounds like one of those exercises that's going to be really good for that. Exactly, and and through that you can learn to what I what I call trust the stick. Um, it's quite difficult when you start when you practice it. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Through that, there's there's a learning of trust in nature, and the nature that you're learning from is that stick itself, and you learn to trust the stick. Where the stick is leading you, you go. And the so that's a kind of an exercise for for learning that sort of direction from you trusting the stick. But there's there's another exercise that I show to people to to get the same idea of trusting the stick to get the same kind of because that's kind of a foundational thing to get that over which is and it's a very different one is as you're moving around if so say just think about this if you hold a stick out in front of you in in your right hand could be you do this in both hands but let's just go with the right hand your palm is upwards and you're just holding the stick in the middle remember does it you're not gripping in the middle yeah this is not martial arts. You're not gripping it. You're just holding it. Yeah. So yeah. you are just hold the hold the line a second, Joe. And we are back. So I've got my hand in the middle of the staff, uh, palm up, um, in the middle. But it's not a martial art. <laughs> so <laughs> it's yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's not a way okay, you would hold I'm it in a martial along. art. It's not a way you would hold it in a martial art. So yeah. So you have an equal end of the sticks extending out to your left and extending out to your right, and the stick is supported by your right palm. Mm-hmm. You can do the I'm mirror holding image that out of this. to my right, right? No, it's Not straight in, in front of you. Your, your hand is straight, straight in front, front of you. Sorry. Got you. Yep. The the left end of the stick is extending out ninety degrees to your left. The right end of the stick mm-hmm. is extending out ninety degrees to your right. This is why you have to forget martial arts, Joe, when you're talking about this stuff. This is not yep. a martial position. Yeah. So so what we're going to do to in this kind of trust the stick number two exercise is we're going to drop the little finger which will bring the left end of the stick down towards your feet and the right end of the stick up towards your head yeah so Mm -hmm. you will turn turn your hand still closed hold still holding the stick and your hand will go palm down so that now your hand is out in front of you right hand is out in front of you this the end of the stick that was pointing out to your right is now pointing out to your left. And the end of the stick yep. that's pointing out to your left is now pointing out to your right. And now you're going to open your hand with your palm down and allow the, the – you turn it a little bit further, a little bit further than, than 180 degrees in the rotation, a little bit further. You're going to open your hand and you're going to allow the momentum of the stick to carry itself over the back of your hand. So the stick is now, so this is where the trust yep. thing comes in. You're going to let go of the stick with your palm down. The The stick is going to rotate across the back of your hand, 
you will want to change your hand position in order to help it. Don't. And the only part of your hand that the stick is contacting now is the back of your hand. You cannot grip the stick. You want to not grip the stick here. This is the trust part. You just allow the stick to roll over the back of your hand. It rolls around. It's under its own momentum, its own rotational momentum. And then as it comes around, you turn your palm slightly back to the to the in a clockwise direction so that the palm is coming upwards again and you just close your hand around the stick once it's finished rotating all the way across the back of your hand yeah i've actually done that kind of a thing and what happens is when you do that and and you let the momentum of the stick go when you grip it again you're in you are slightly off the middle again aren't you you're... Oh, don't worry about stuff like that. Don't worry about that stuff like that. I, I might be slightly off the middle when I start, let alone at the, the end. Uh, that, that's not a bit... I mean, it is true that that happens, but who cares? It, it makes no difference to what you're trying to learn. Um, you know, you could. I could hold it um, 80% my of the way point, towards one end point, or the other. It'll roll right you over could. the back. My only yeah. point there is it, it, I know the kind of thing you're, af- you, you're getting at there, but if you're not... It gets it gets more difficult. Yeah, it gets more difficult. That's true. Yeah, so that's um, why I said hold it in the middle. It doesn't. You can hold it anywhere you like. It just gets more difficult. Yeah. That's all. And and it is yeah. possible when you get good at it. It is possible to roll it straight over the back of your hand and you'll catch it. You turn around and it comes back into your palm in exactly the same position you started. That's uh, that's entirely possible. Uh, you just got to learn it first, though. That's the point. We're talking about a very for people. This is a description for people who haven't done it before. Obviously, Joe has. Um, but the most, much more common mistake when people try this exercise is the loose trust. And instead of properly rolling it across the back of the hand where they cannot, you can't grip it unless you're one of those weird people that can bend your fingers backwards, um, you, you, can't, you want it going across the back of your hand because you cannot grip it. That's why. What you get people is quickly flicking it and it rotates on the surface of their palm rather than over the back of the hand. That's a mistake. That's not trusting the stick, yeah? It must go cleanly across the back of your hand with you making no attempt whatsoever to grip it. That's the that's the point. And so it's all, sure it's a lot easier just to spin the stick around on your palm and catch it again, but it's not, we're not doing this because it's easy. We're doing this because we want to learn the, the trust of the stick that we're using in the same way that yeah. we were in the previous exercise. So that's the other thing that I get people doing. And then... What's very, uh, what's a lot of fun is to just to roll. So, you you roll it over the back of your hand, and it comes to rest in your palm again. So you're basically back in the original position. And then what's really nice is you come into half task position. You put the stick into the upward turned palm of your left hand, and then immediately rotate it the other way around the left hand. And so you're switching hands each time through the yeah. half task position. Um, I think. I've probably shown you this at some point in time, but you're switching hands each time through the have task position. Um, and it becomes a very, very fun, enjoyable exercise in which you'll quickly find that the stick is deciding your personal movement. You're not deciding your personal movement because if you start deciding your personal movement, you're going to start dropping the stick. That's what's going to happen. Um, you have to trust the stick. And you have to, where the stick wants to go, that's where the stick's going. And you are there as the second person, as the follower, as the person who is supporting <laughs> the, the momentum of the stick, not my, the other my, way. Uh, my rational brain, Damon, is going, I really like this one because it's repetitive. It, goes, yeah. like, it does the same thing It is thing repetitive, over over but <laughs> it shouldn't stay repetitive. It shouldn't stay yeah, repetitive. Yeah, because know. obviously the next thing I'm going to say is you take the first exercise we described with the, the stick being cradled in the half task position and opening out into the direction of your turns. So say I'm opening out to the left, the stick's off my left arm. I make the left turn, and as I'm making it, I immediately rotate it with my left hand, and it goes over the back of my left hand, comes back into my left hand, and then I cradle it, and I make the right turn, and so I'm combining the two movements together in one movement. Yeah. So that's um you you don't want it to say simplistic where you're simply rotating it in the air in front of you. Yeah, it but even that one you just said is still repetitive, dance. right? It's still a it's still you go to the so you're you're it sh- it in start. this context right now. Sorry? It shouldn't be repetitive, but it will start repetitive. Um because who says which way I'm gonna turn? After the turn left. Yeah. I might turn left again. I might turn right. I might switch around and go backwards. 
I might start reversing. I Maybe might, a better know. way to explain it, instead of being repetitive, is you've got this small group of movements and you are using those in a creative way. Mm. And you, <laughs> Yes. All, th- all things considered, shamanic technique. But yes, yeah, yeah, but to small... start off with, sure, do it repetitive to start off with. That, that's a good way because you remember you've got to get it to the point where you don't think about it. And it's way yeah. easier to do it repetitive if you don't think about it than it is to put a lot of variety into it and not think about it. Um, but what you're looking at or what you're looking for is uchile tai or uchilete, yeah, which is to the moment, your momentum which remember is also the stick's momentum your your combined momentum as one entity stick you if you think of that or you stick um you know if you wrote the word you <laughs> and the word stick without any space between them that's what you're trying to be is yeah. wound becomes wound like a bobbin wound like thread on a bobbin um and starts surging doiguluk that's a mongol word um as as you move around a tarug in your in your circle in your grove, so this is this is the play the start of play with a a sham staff used for the purpose of spirit dance or supporting the richness and variety within spirit dance. The reason I really like it and the reason I think it's really really important is. It's too easy because we are familiar, we're moving creatures. We've evolved to move. It's too easy to start incorporating non chelicity based movements, movements that don't support physical chelicity into our spirit dance and imagine that we are doing in, in our brains only, imagine that we are incorporating physical chelicity. The stick will if you allow it to teach you, it will stop you from doing that. It will physically stop you from doing that. Because if you don't have yeah, the so physical chelicity... it's a useful chelicity tool for the, chelicity the then, isn't it? Yeah, if you don't have the physical chelicity with a stick, you're going to be dropping the stick apart from anything else or getting whacked in the face with it and this sort of stuff. So so it, it's a very useful tool for that, indeed. Um, and, and for many, many other things as well. And you can use it throughout your spirit dance and there's endless... Movements you can incorporate in patterns of movement, patterns of energy that you incorporate into your spirit dance using stick or sticks to make it richer, to make it a more uh, expansive and extensive and um, flavorsome radar for nature, which is ultimately what this stuff's all about. You're creating a radar for nature. But the great thing is, you know, we start with Amska. What's the closest part of nature to you? It's your physical body. But then you incorporate a stick into what you're doing, irrespective of what type of shamanic technique is. And now you've got another pitch of nature that's close to you, that you're cradling indeed in the half task position. You're cradling it. it. And there's another piece of nature that is come close to you, that it's easy for you to interact with and learn from. And so, you know, we build outwards, don't we, as shamans? We start, we start in and we work outwards. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's a quite a good place to, to sort of wind up. The, yeah. Um, I think the thing to say is that we there are lots and lots of other things, other techniques that we could talk about with a stick, but that's a couple of, you know, a practical podcast, that's a couple of practical techniques that you can incorporate into your level three chelicity um, and Amska. Uh, obviously, you know, mm. all the stuff we talked about before, you have to be doing this without thinking about it or you have to be good enough at it that you can do it without thinking about it. You have to have that lightweight of observation of self. You need to be able to understand what your stick body is doing. You're, again, not putting a space between the word stick and body. What your stick body is doing without affecting through your mind what your stick body is doing. All of that stuff still has to be in place for for these kind of uh, spirit, spirit dance techniques to be useful. Um, but, you know, we keep repeating that. I guess it, it there's, yeah. there's no harm in repeating it too many times. So, for the purposes of clarity, then, what would be, what would the difference be between the you, using the staff in an Amska stage two way as opposed to what we've what I, what I gather we've talked about here in the context of a stage three? Yeah, well, uh, the stage technique. two just has to be there. The stage two ability has to be there. 
So, you know, we, otherwise it's going to be meaningless. Yeah. All that, that observation mm. of self that you're learning through your Amska practices, that has to be on in stage three. So it's not like stage two goes away. It just has to be there. And I don't think that anybody who's not got onto stage three yet and is just still on stage two stuff should be touching a stick, to be honest. Uh, just leave, leave off the stick. <laughs> You're probably better off so with a drum. Stop touching your sticks. You're better off with a drum. Stop touching your sticks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're better off with a drum. If you do want to use something for your level two practice, my opinion is a drum is better for that kind of thing. Uh, you just yeah. need the level two skill to be there. You need the AMSCA skill to be there when you attempt this kind of thing. If it's not, then there's no point in attempting it. It's probably much that way around. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, fantastic. I think... Um, as as always is the case with this stuff, there's there's plenty more avenues we could go down with talking about the stick, I would presume. But this is a fantastic kind of um, get started point, particularly for level three. So when I'm when I'm putting the notes together for this for this episode, do you think um, we should include that it's sort of like a, a definite stage three technique? It's something. It's an it's a general interest episode, but definitely more geared towards. Stage three. Yeah, it definitely. Sense. It's just a way, a, another thing to add into your stage three practice. But obviously, yeah. the, that thread we've been talking about at stage four, that thread it, it extends through this stick. That's the the stick is entirely part of that thread. So it, obviously, it's a level four technique as well. Yeah. Yeah, because another series of episodes that I'm really looking forward to doing, Damon, is 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 looking at alternate stage three techniques, and we've talked about that a few times, haven't we? So yeah, that'll be a nice. Um, avenue to go down at some point um but anyway should we leave it there then yeah let's leave it there mate okay fantastic well i hope you've enjoyed that one and um you've got something out of it and as always you go ahead and uh, give these exercises a try i hope that's um helped you understand a little bit more about what the shaman's staff is from a woven energy real practical shamanism perspective as always you can head to um uh, patreon.com slash woven energy and support us over there and also i would ask two things one if you could give us an honest review wherever you listen to this podcast helps us get our podcast in front of other people and number two uh, if you know anybody who you think would benefit or enjoy this podcast then you know pass it along and give them a gentle nudge to give us a try and uh, and have a listen anyway thanks for listening guys and i will and we will both see you in the next one all the best thanks 